Hello, welcome everybody. This is Pooja Pai, president of the UCI ICS alumni chapter. Today we have Raj joining us, who is also an alumni. I will let him talk a little bit more about his bio. Just wanted to give a couple quick updates for what's coming up. We have Giving Day that is coming up on Tuesday night and all day Wednesday. So we encourage um, ICS alumni to pay it forward. Show us that ICS stands for I Can Support. You will get email um, about the actual link and when the time starts. So please check your inboxes next week um, on Monday. And Raj will present a part two next Friday. And we hope to have Dean Marios join us um, on June 12th. And then we have a couple other exciting events, which I'll talk to you guys about at the end. So without further ado, Raj, take it. Go ahead. Thanks, Pooja. Can you hear me OK? Yeah. Sorry. OK, I'm going to make sure the audio is working OK and share my screen here. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. Uh, I'll just go through briefly in my bio, just to give a, a little bit of a background on on the topic today. I know everybody comes from a kind of varied background. My background also is a bit varied in that uh, when I graduated from ICS, I worked for uh, SoCal Edison doing financial automation work. Uh, from there, I kind of moved on to the big four. I did a lot of technology integration work, first with Deloitte Consulting, um, and then I did work with KPMG after that. So I've done some large technology integrations uh, for the uh, Department of Public Health, uh, as well as the Administrative Office of the Courts. Uh, so that's a lot of my core technology implementation experience. Uh, around the time that uh, SOX 404 started, uh, I joined KPMG. And so KPMG, uh, you may or may not know, they focus more on the, the governance aspect. Uh, of IT. So I got certified in SAP security, uh, the governance of SAP, governance of Oracle ERP, uh, and then other cloud-based uh, ERPs as well. Um, so from there, I kind of worked in the industry specializing in the SAP area, Oracle, uh, as well as other SaaS-based cloud applications like NetSuite. Um, so my experience kind of spans across the board, uh, both in the Big Four area as well as in the industry. I also was a senior manager and director at Hyundai uh, prior to joining my current company, Focal Point, uh, where I lead up the practice and I do several implementations uh, as well as PMO work and IT security and audit work. So that leads me to the topic for today. Um, the reason I gave that uh, background is because audit is, uh, in, in this particular information security area, is very broad. So when we go through the topics for today, uh, you'll see that there is a great deal of overlap between IT, uh, which is my first background, uh, as well as the compliance area, the IT audit area, uh, and then the information security. So there's a great deal of overlap. And I think my background kind of helps me in that way because I can speak across the board and uh, give a good overview of this topic. So in terms of our agenda, Kind of broken this up into a few parts because the topic is so broad. Uh, first, we'll just talk about the overview. What what does IT risk actually mean, and what do we mean when we say governance of IT risk? And we'll talk more specifically about information security, uh, cybersecurity, IT audit, how those uh, kind of interplay along with IT, uh, and then give a kind of an introduction to what IT audit does. Um, and then the next uh, next week we'll focus more on the data privacy aspect. And if uh, folks are interested in careers in the IT risk management area, I can talk more specifically about that. Also, as we go through today, um, you can submit your questions. I will try to field those questions at the end of this talk today. And if we run out of time, then I'll be happy to get back to you via email. So just the objectives, uh, again, provide a broad overview of information security and its impact to the business, kind of what's hot topic, in the industry right now and, and what do we see going forward, especially as the economy has taken a big hit. What we've seen is that information security and cybersecurity continues to be a hot topic. Uh, and a lot of companies actually have increased their spend. Uh, I see that because my clients themselves 
um, you know, they're continuing on with the work that we had originally signed. And also we're getting additional work as a result of the, the work being done remotely. Uh, then I wanna talk a little bit about the benefits of, of building a relationship with information security, IS meaning information security, and uh, how we can make that work for the organization across the board. When I say across the board, that includes IT audit, includes compliance, includes uh, uh, information technology, information security, data privacy, they're really impacting many parts of the business. And then I'll talk about some of the frameworks that we utilize uh, to build that framework, to, to make the organization secure from an information security standpoint. So some of the frameworks I'll talk about is a cybersecurity framework, which is developed by NIST. There are also uh, this NICE framework, which is developed by ISO. And then there's the COVID 2019, which is developed by ISACA. Um, so those organizations and those frameworks are the primary ones that we use. There are others out there as well. There's in the European Union, they, a lot of the data privacy and, and information security is driven by NIMITY. So if you work with a lot of European companies, they'll use a the NIMITY framework. And then uh, last but not least, I'll provide some recommendations on how to go about building that information security program. So from a governance aspect, um, I want to talk a little bit about the responsibility, who's actually responsible, who's accountable, basically who gets fired if something goes wrong. So the board of directors, uh, they do a survey every year. And what they found is that 54% of the organizations actually put the responsibility of cybersecurity uh, and information security in, in the hands of audit. The reason they do that is because of independence and also because they report up the audit, the audit committee reports up to the risk committee and the risk committee then uh, reports up to the board of directors. So because of independence and that reporting line, the primary responsibility actually falls outside of information security and, and within the organization. So there will be a data privacy uh, or organization often housed inside information security, sometimes outside. Um, the information technology will be uh, again, outside of audit, but the responsibility ultimately rolls up to audit. So that is kind of why, from a governance aspect, you know, I am heavily involved in the uh, IT security area. I work uh, with uh, information security to make sure their governance, their governance programs and the information security programs are compliant, uh, as well as making sure that uh, they are efficient. So I'll talk a little bit about efficiency and then how to help them fill the gaps in their information security programs. The other thing to note here is that there is a increased spend in terms of information security. However, only 15% of those directors, board of directors said that they were satisfied with the, with the outcomes. So there is a business case for improving outcomes and with more money, they should be actually getting better outcomes. Obviously they're not. So you see some of the problems in the industry in terms of uh, the cost of data breaches going up. I think the, the biggest one I saw is Facebook and they had to pay a, a, for a data privacy fine. Uh, they paid $5 billion, that was last year. So the, the fines themselves are going up and then you see there's market risk as well. Even the platform I'm using now, Zoom, they took a hit from the market uh, when there were some data privacy issues which they later fixed but the list kind of goes on and on. It's just not limited to you know, the larger companies or tech companies. It's uh, you know Home Depot, Target, Marriott. So it's pretty much everybody. So I wanted to provide this working definition and the working definition is really just to point out that um, you know, inherent to where the data is moving, like for example, you talk about print, electronic or any other form of uh, confidential private data, Really the organization has to be able to have very robust data management program. Without that data management program, you're not gonna be able to really classify the data, monitor the data, uh, you know, destruction of that data, so on and so forth. And the reason I call that out is because there's no actual legal requirement that you have to have a data management program. Actually, none of the frameworks call that out specifically. They say what, you know, what you need to protect. They don't say how you need to do it. So one of the key things to take away from the definition is that inherent to the definition is the management of the data. 
to the organization and, and whether your data management program, master data management program is effective. So I think as uh, computer science and, and information security professionals, we should really be focusing on how we can help organizations manage that data. That will go a long way in terms of their compliance efforts. So uh, some of the top audit initiatives, and the reason I use the word audit is because um, you know, my work is to make sure that the programs for information security and cybersecurity are compliant. So what I see in the marketplace is from an audit lens, but I do see it from um, the cybersecurity side. Uh, so for example, uh, the programs that we audit, I mentioned those frameworks. I talked about the NIST uh, cybersecurity framework. I talked about COVID. So depending on the organization and, and the sector, for example, healthcare will have uh, their own framework. And then uh, for governance, a lot of times, for the government agencies, a lot of times it's NIST. But based on the, the industry, the framework will be different. Um, so a lot of the uh, focus right now is to kind of help to standardize a lot of that and to make sure that the cybersecurity program itself is robust and able to keep up with the new regulations. The next talk I'll talk about, you know, uh, privacy, but for example, the CCPA is a new privacy legislation and your cybersecurity program has to be able to be robust enough to keep up with those, those requirements. So that's why it's at the top of the list. Um, the, all of these are important, of course, you got data privacy and, and you're looking at the governance aspect and obviously BCP and DR, business continuity, disaster recovery, that's significant uh, in terms of what's going on with COVID. Um, but I think the top three that I would select here uh, would be first number two, the privacy and data management aspect. The reason I would select that one is because half of the information security and cybersecurity requirements actually come out of data privacy. And with the CCPA already passing as law in California and actually coming into enforcement next month, the uh, attorney general said they're not moving that date forward. So we're gonna see more fines related to that. So that's gonna be very significant in terms of moving information security forward. Uh, and then the second one I would select is a third party and vendor management. And that one seems counterintuitive because a lot of the times people feel that, look, I, I'm transferring my risk. I have, uh, or I have a ERP system. I, for example, employed uh, NetSuite to manage my general ledger, which is all the financial transactions. And therefore I transferred my risk. And that's actually not true because uh, from a contractual obligation, uh, you're still responsible for the reporting of that data. Uh, from a privacy aspect as well as a financial aspect. And then there are requirements that the vendor, for example, uh, NetSuite will say you are required to implement. So NetSuite as a organization will issue a service auditor report or a SOC report. And in there they'll say the organization is required to meet certain control objectives. That's an example of uh, not being able to transfer your risk just by hiring a third party. And so that uh, the vendor management area is very uh, detailed, but I'm just giving you a couple of snippets of, of, of why that area is counterintuitive. There are re requirements for the organization to implement what are called complementary user entity controls, which are uh, controls the organization is required to implement. And then there are contractual obligations. Uh, they're required to manage their hypervisor um, so there are a whole host of requirements uh, that you can't just transfer the risk. And then number six kind of goes along with that, which is the cloud security aspect. So NetSuite was an independent company and then it was later bought by Oracle. Um, so a lot of the companies I've seen are moving to the cloud like I'm sure everybody else has seen. So AWS, Azure, et cetera. Um, so what I see in the industry is that a lot of the cybersecurity area is really being moved to the cloud uh, and, and that area is gonna be significant because I think as computer science, information security professionals, we have to be very cognizant of, of the developments in terms of both the technology as well as the governance aspect. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the SDLC model later, 
and how we can uh, incorporate security into that SDLC model as it relates to either the traditional waterfall, agile, or in this case, the cloud security aspect. So I think a lot of the times information security, when we think of information security, we talk about how can we protect that data? That's kind of what people think of. And that makes sense. But I think one of the keys to uh, understand is that we want to make sure that the data itself maintains the integrity as well as the availability. And the reason that's significant is because, again, if you don't have a robust data management program, uh, you know, if you can access that data, it isn't really going to do much good if it's not accurate, number one. And two, you're not going to be able to access it, then it's not really good to anybody. So you don't want to make it so secure that the organization is like, oh, I can't really conduct my operations. So you have to keep this in mind as, uh, as, uh, as professionals that when you design software or we create programs like information security programs, then we make it so that it's actually enabling the business and not stifling the business. So that's very significant. And the framework that we follow from a risk management standpoint is kind of driven by um, this, this model, which is to categorize, select, implement, access, and authorize and monitor the data. The reason this is significant is because it actually incorporates a lot of the enterprise. So we talked about the ability for uh, compliance, uh, information security audit and IT to work together. So what you see here is that uh, when you do the categorization, that, that area really does fall within information security. Then the selection of those controls oftentimes falls within the compliance area. The implementation falls within information technology. So they'll help to implement the Splunk Etc. Or, for example, BlackBerry Silence has a lot of automation built in for their cybersecurity. They'll use a lot of those tools. The assessment is uh, heavily dependent on audit because of the independence, and then the authorized and monitoring, as well as kind of a split between audit and compliance. Um, so there, this 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 uh, framework kind of drives home the point that it's like an integrated framework that really requires the entire organization to work together. Um, so when we look at the controls themselves, um, the frameworks that I mentioned earlier, the NIST cybersecurity framework, uh, the COBIT framework, uh, all of these really have three areas that they focus on. So every, every uh, framework kind of will go into these three buckets, the physical controls, logical controls, administrative controls. My work, because I'm on the IT security and audit side, is really focused on the technological controls and the administrative controls, but physical controls are significant as well. Um, those are things, you know, like for example, access to the data center. It used to be that, you know, uh, before when we didn't have cloud applications, you would have to get, uh, you, there were like CFOs that had access to the data center. And that was a big problem because they can just connect their, uh, you know, um, they can connect directly to the data center and, and change information, which is a big problem. That's a little bit more difficult now, obviously, because of the cloud applications. So I really focus more on the logical technological controls, and that focuses on access to programs and data. Uh, there's a whole host of controls there. I can share that list with you and what those controls actually uh, translate into in terms of technological requirements. Um, and then focusing on change management, system development, and then there are what's called business automated controls, uh, which are more focused on reporting requirements for financial data. Um, so I can share those with you as well. And then there are administrative controls that really focus on the governance aspect. That would be things like policies, procedures. Um, how are we going to deal with uh, applications that are not compliant with data privacy requirements? I had a a CIO that I worked with at BlackBerry Silence, and he refused to use an application just because it didn't meet the data privacy and cybersecurity requirements. So again, that's very significant. Uh, it will drive which applications are adopted in the organizations and which ones are let go. So this is not uh, something that is just uh, you know an IT related issue. It really translates to executive management and they they often rely on us to provide them with the background to make that decision. So in terms of th uh, threat landscape and, and what that looks like, there are really two buckets. It 
translates into either internal or external sources of threat. And I think a lot of people underestimate the internal uh, threats because uh, within the organization, you, know, you have uh, people that are busy or they just don't understand cybersecurity. So <clears throat> whether that be you know simple as clicking on a link they don't understand or giving access to information, uh, that can be a real problem from a legal aspect and open the company up to a lot of risk. Um, so what we see you know, in this area is that, uh, for example, if there's a, a breach in the organization, uh, that can actually lead to now class action lawsuits because uh, CCPA allows for class action lawsuits, which is the new data privacy uh, legislation, which it, before it was really not up to individual citizens to go and sue the company, but now that actually opens up a big door. Uh, and again, we saw that Facebook fine of $5 billion and we saw others as well in the Home Depot and pretty much every industry. The external threats, uh, I think a lot of times, those are the ones that make the news. Um, you know, a lot of times it has to do with social engineering, people either trying to uh, get into the organization because they are able to uh, identify um, who you work with. So they'll go to LinkedIn, et cetera, and then try to establish a connection based on your peer group. Uh, or it'll be more technical, like they'll find a backdoor uh, or for example, zero day attacks where the threat itself hasn't been identified, they'll exploit that. So there are a lot of uh, external threats that we deal with as a company and we do extensive penetration testing. And that's where those cybersecurity programs really come into play because we try to address both the internal as well as the external risks. The internal risks, uh, I think when we look at IT SOCs, um, they actually deal with a lot of the same requirements in terms of information security and cybersecurity. So kind of, again, interplay between what IT audit can do as well as information security kind of working together. Uh, I think for this slide, I'm gonna let you read the rest of this, but uh, one of the key takeaways here is that it's not just the financial loss to the company, there's a reputational loss as well. You may never get it back. For example, Target had a data breach about three years ago and they lost a lot of their customers uh, in terms of having their, you know, the, the target accounts that people never came back. And the same is true for, I think, Experian who had the data breach. Um, so there's a lot of things that you can't really get back even after the money is paid. So you gotta be careful in terms of uh, the non-monetary losses. So the interplay I talked about uh, in terms of what IT audit, information security and compliance can to, do together is actually a requirement uh, if you look at financial institutions. So a lot of banks I work with uh, are required to have three lines of defense. The first line of defense is IT operations. Um, so they're you know, the ones that are actually information technology that are, are doing the data mapping. They have the infrastructure. And so they are responsible to help implement those uh, corrupt, corrective controls. The, the second line of defense is more on the compliance side. So the compliance is because audit cannot, <clears throat> cannot actually become part of the controls themselves. So they rely on compliance to be able to implement uh, some of the programs uh, from scratch. Uh, they probably get input from audit as well. And then when they implement these, they have to look at the laws and regulations. They have to make sure that it's not a set and forget. Uh, they're basically uh, updating them continuously. And the third line of defense is IT audit, because again, we are having ultimate responsibility. And if something happens, legal comes back to audit first. Why didn't you identify this? Why didn't you help to remediate this? Why didn't we uh, help them to fix it essentially before we had either a data breach or a legal fine, et cetera. All right, so I'm not gonna spend too much time on this slide except to say that, uh, so information security and audit sometimes have a uh, conflicting relationship because the auditors are obviously looking to make sure that everything is perfect. And you know, information security is of the, of the opinion that will never be perfect, which makes sense because you're not gonna have unlimited amount of funds so it's a really a risk-based approach. And so the best thing I can say is that the uh, Richard Chambers, who is the head of the Internal Audit Association, he said that you know, IT audit 
should really be a partner to the enterprise. And so I follow that approach in my practice as well. We implement controls based on a risk-based approach, risks based on the industry, the risk appetite for the company, as well as the legal and regulatory requirements. And so that way we can actually help information security meet their objectives within their budget or help them get more budget. And you know, we try not to become the police officer for the company. So I mentioned earlier about integrating into the SDLC. So this slide, you know, what you see here is that the ability for audit and information security to be really embedded into the SDLC process. This is really driving home the point that if you're proactive rather than reactive, then you're gonna have much better outcomes as an organization. You don't wanna wait till the end and then develop the software and then figure out, oh, how are we gonna secure this or is this even secure? That's not gonna work. So especially when you talk about the new applications that are going to the cloud, you better integrate it with the cloud provider because otherwise you're not gonna be, you're not gonna be able to do it at the end. So very important that as we implement our SDLC processes, we integrate uh, information security and the validation by audit into the process from the beginning. I have only a few minutes left, so I'm gonna try to uh, wrap it up. Uh, again, being able to embed audit into the IT risk uh, lifecycle is significant uh, for many aspects. Uh, I think when we talk about risk and identification all the way to the analysis, it's basically a, a circular because you're doing this as a continuous iteration. It's not a set and forget type of exercise. I will skip through this slide in the interest of time. Uh, suffice this to say that um, the interaction between the organization is going to be key to making this successful. Um, I wanted to actually talk about some examples though. Like for example, I work with Hyundai and Hyundai, um, they are having major issues with IT security and also IT SOX compliance. And so they came to audit and, and we helped them to implement a lot of the security frameworks and controls. And there what we were able to do is by working with uh, information security, we helped them to gain, uh, to improve their security posture, but we also helped them reduce cost, which is a big deal nowadays, obviously. So we actually were able to test a lot of the information security controls on their behalf as IT audit and that helped them to become compliant as well as save costs. And then another example would be Opus Bank. So Opus Bank, another client of mine, what we did there is we worked with information security and we helped them uh, to actually, so we did their first review of information security and it was terrible. So we helped them to increase the security posture by integrating a lot of the work again, uh, kind of working alongside uh, implementation of the, the program implementation of the controls. And then the key was helping them to identify where the gaps was and also helping them to uh, gain additional resources. So again, they don't, they don't have the visibility to the risk committee, the audit committee. So I, as IT auditors, we really have a lot of say in the organization. So we're able to help information security, uh, gain better resources, help them to identify gaps risk create those gaps because we can't really resolve everything. And then uh, it basically helped them to remediate a lot of those uh, findings as well. 40% uh, was the amount of money we were able to save out of their information security budget by helping them to test a lot of those information security controls. So we were really able to integrate our, our work together. And, and as a result, the company saved money. We increased the security posture for the company. So it was a win-win situation across the board. All right, uh, I think we talked about this already. Uh, we don't wanna do a set and forget approach because uh, the technological landscape, the regulatory landscape is uh, continuously evolving as we see with the CCPA. So we wanna make sure that we continuously improve on, on the information security model that we have. Okay, um, I think a lot of the, this has been um, talked about in terms of the examples I gave in terms of embedding each other into the organization. Um, so I'll skip to this slide. All right, and I think I'm approaching the end. So there's two things I wanted to discuss. 
Um, one is the frameworks. So I think this is really where the crux of a lot of the, the information security programs uh, basically goes. Uh, so if you are interested in implementing, implementing or understanding cybersecurity, I would start with one of these frameworks. The NIST cybersecurity framework is probably the most widely used in terms of governance of, of um, you know, cybersecurity, information security. Um, the second one would be the ISO framework, ISO 27001, ISO 27002. So I would say either of them are okay. The reason I, I, I selected NIST here is because this also came out with a NIST privacy framework, which integrates really well with their uh, NIST cybersecurity framework. Um, so I think this is why I'm so, uh, kind of selecting this one. Also, I wanted to share with you is um, this is a mapping that you know we've done, and uh, this is basically talking about the integration of the different frameworks together. So the COVID 2019 framework, uh, this is basically an IT audit framework, and then this is mapped to the CSF, which is a cybersecurity framework I was just sharing with you. And really, what we're showing here is that there is a one-to-one -one integration between the two. Uh, between the two frameworks, they're really kind of consistent and working together. And by having that working together, um, you, as IT auditors, you know, we can really do a lot of the same work. There's no reason to repeat the work in the organization and we can help the organization become compliant. And obviously uh, information security will be appreciated of that because they won't be facing fines, regulations, and they'll also be able to save, in some cases, we save 40% of the budget for the company. So again, great opportunity for the organization to collaborate here. And so the frameworks that I pointed out here, I'll be able to share with you as well. You can also find some of them online. I think the NIST framework is available for download. The ISO framework is not but I can share with you some details if you're interested in that. And then in closing, I just wanted to point out that when we do look at uh, IT audit, and we're looking at it from the lens of financial applications uh, because of IT SOX compliance, uh, you know, we start from the operating system, we go up to the database security layer, then we look up the application security layer, um, which is this area here, the SAP basis. And then we keep on going up and up and up. So the, when we go up, we get to business automated controls. These are business controls that are configurable for financial reporting, for example. So when we're doing a lot of the work for uh, IT SOX compliance, IT audit, um, you know, we're looking across the board, all the way from the operating system, database, application, all the way to the business. Um, so I think this is, again, just speaks to the point that, you know, the ability for individuals to, really uh, integrate uh, across the organization and we can provide a lot of value by, by uh, doing the work for information security uh, and working alongside information security. If you're interested in learning more about either SAP or Oracle or NetSuite or generally how IT audit works uh, and how it integrates with cybersecurity, I can certainly provide more details there. I think in closing, um, I will hand it back to Pooja I think we might have some questions as well. Thank you so much, Raj. It was a great topic. Uh, I think uh, there's a couple of questions if you will be sharing this deck. And I yes, know. I can share this deck. Uh, I also have part two. So we can share the deck either now or we can share it uh, however you want to do it. We can share it together. Okay, sure. Yeah, so you can let me know. Um, so if anybody wants the deck, um, you can send me a message uh, privately to the UCI ICS alumni chapter at gmail.com. And this is also on the YouTube channel. So I, if anyone else has questions, please turn on your videos. I uh, just wanted to, again, say thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Raj. Um, again, upcoming events. On Wednesday, we have Giving Day, so please support. Um, ICS and UCI, and we will have Raj speaking to part two, which will be IT audit and data privacy next Friday 
and we have hopefully Dean Mario's joining us the week after. So we have a couple of great events. Again, like, follow, share on social media. And we will kind of address some chat. Um, yeah, you guys can unmute, turn on videos if you have any other questions, comments. <laughs> Uh, I just a quick question for Raj. So is your company, is there, is your focus of the, the, what you do in your company, IT security and audits yes. and stuff like that? Okay. Uh, that's about 90% uh, of what we do. So Focal Point uh, is a national company based out of Tampa, Florida. I lead up their LA office. We pretty much have offices in every major city in the U S and about 90% of our work focuses on uh, cybersecurity that includes information security, data privacy, uh, penetration testing, uh, and then about 10% uh, really focuses around the uh, IT SOX compliance area because a lot of the financial reporting applications will require the validation of the IT applications to be able to report public financial statements. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you dealt with or worked with credit card companies much? We do a lot of the PCI compliance work as well. So uh, we are certified to do PCI compliance. So a lot of the banks in particular will hire us to do that kind of work. Um, and then I think the credit card companies like Visa, et cetera, we work with them, but we do a lot of cybersecurity work with them as well. So the PCI, I think is basically a subset of cybersecurity. Sorry, no other questions. Uh, thank you again, everybody, for joining, and thank you, Raj. See you guys next week. All right, thank you. Appreciate it. Bye.